Well, I invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, where we continue our series through this letter, looking at verses 6 to 16 this morning, gathering and rejoicing indeed that uh, the Lord's mercy is so much more. So hear the word of the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Let's pray together. Father, we do give you thanks for your rich, deep, and abundant mercy. We come because you have called us. We recognize that we are unable to come because of that mercy. And we gather around your word, for which we also give thanks. We thank you that you have spoken, that you have preserved your word through the ages against so many challenges or difficulties. We thank you that we have copies before us this morning and that we can gather freely to hear from you. So we ask, Lord, that you might speak by your spirit through your word because we need to hear from you. We ask that you would challenge and comfort Instruct, rebuke, heal, and lift up. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, it's good to get to be back with you this week. Having missed last week, thank you for your very kind gift uh, that was waiting for me when I got back for Pastor's Appreciation uh, Month. I appreciate that. And uh, I'll just say here, I'll be out next week. Um, I will leave pretty quickly after this service to head west, where I'll, uh, over the week, preach at a couple different state conventions for the pastor's conferences. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday, be with the O'Days and the Thompsons, our missionary partners, uh, preaching in their church in Utah. So it'd be good to catch up with them. And uh, I look forward for you to have the opportunity to hear from Frank Anderson. We thank Dr. Green for uh, preaching last week, so a lot of those things going on. But mentioning being out last week, I was in Somerset, Kentucky, so last Saturday I was driving to Somerset, Kentucky. I had a rental car for it, so I was going along and I needed to get gas. And so as I always try to do, I looked for an exit that also had a Sonic. The refuel in both ways. And so I found one, and it was one of my known stops. And so I went through the gas station and was able to pull in by the pump, fill up, and just pull right back out that way. You'll see why that's important in a minute. Then I went over to the Sonic and pulled into one of those stalls, ordered my unsweet tea with peach, had that, was prepared for my journey. This rental car, though, uh, the gear shift or whatever you call these things now when you're not really changing gears, I needed to go from park to reverse. 
Now, this is one of these weird ones. I don't know why. I like it when the thing moves, right, and stays where I put it so I know where we are. But this is one of those that kind of toggles. You, you push it, and it comes back to, to center and, and these kind of things. So it's already a little weird, but I got it, and I pushed it where it's supposed to go to reverse, and it wouldn't go to reverse. I tried it. I tried it calmly. <laughs> I tried it forcefully. And I thought, I am sitting at a Sonic in Dixon, in case you need to stop there. I am three and a half hours or more away from where I need to be, and I can't make this car reverse out of this stall. I tried and I tried. I began to sweat. And then I realized I can get it to neutral, and I'm on a little bit of an incline. So I put it in neutral, and I let go, and it, I began to slowly roll out. But then it came to rest when I wasn't far enough back to be able to turn with a car bes beside me, and a couple of cars had backed up behind me. So I pulled back in, and I pulled up as far as I could go. And then got it into neutral, which was not easy either. And then it rolled, and I got just far enough back where I could now go forward, and I was on my way. I still had to stop for gas another time, but then I did find I was in the hills of Kentucky, and I, man, I parked on a really sharp spot. <laughs> and all was good. I called the rental car place on the way to try to get something sorted, and they said, oh, that's great, we'll take care of you, but we can't do anything now, just call on Monday. Not very helpful. Sunday, the people had to come pick me up to take me to church since I, I couldn't back out. I tried to find a place you could just pull in and pull out, but they didn't have any of those. Sunday afternoon, when I decided I think I can roll and I want to figure this thing out, I did get in the car, and I realized that on this little toggle thing, there's a button on the right that if you push that, you can get it into reverse. <laughs> Now, how I had reversed out of my house before this, I don't know. But I figured, how, figured out how it's supposed to work, and everything was good from then on. Which makes my point. We need to know how things work in order to get anything done. We need to know what gives direction to things like our lives. This text that I titled for today, A Good Servant of Christ Jesus. If you have an ESV, that's just the, the label put on top of the paragraph. This text is getting to the center, really, of how we go about being faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like I was stuck not being able to make the car do what I needed to do, if we don't grasp what this text is telling us, we will be stuck. And as I look out across American Christianity, I wonder if we're not stuck. We've talked a little bit over the last few weeks about different challenges culturally. We find ourselves in a setting where the culture is more and more opposed to who we are, and we've talked about the fact we shouldn't be surprised by that. As one of the martyrs under the Nazis said, the church returning to a state of conflict with the world around it is just returning to its normal state. But as we see that happening, much of the church seems stuck, powerless, directionless. The truths here in this text aren't probably surprising to most of us, but they are the central points about how we grow as disciples of the Lord Jesus. Now, it is directed first to Timothy in his role of leading the church there. So, first in his role as a pastor. And this text is rich with implications and applications for pastors. And we do have some of our pastors right here, so it applies to them. But it applies to all of us because as we're going to see, he points to Timothy as being an example to all the others. So this text is not just about pastors, but it's about all of us, how we can be faithful servants of the Lord Jesus. Now, in this text... The points that are mentioned are restated several times, and so I'm going to gather them into three headings for us this morning, because I already promised Bill Nance to try to stay within two hours, so we'll 
will gather them into three categories that I'm going to label teach faithfully, be an example, and train for godliness. So let's look first of all. This text says a lot about calling Timothy and therefore us to teach faithfully. And again, this does apply to our pastors. It applies to a pastor we're going to call, but it also applies to us in various ways. So several verses here. Notice first of all that verse 6 and verse 11 make this point. So these paragraphs are kind of parallel. So he begins the first paragraph, verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Put these things before. That's a way of talking about teaching. What does he mean by these things? At least the previous paragraph and perhaps all that he said so far. He's saying, if you will put these things before, if you will remind, if you will teach the church these important things. Just out of the previous paragraph, pointing out error and the truth that goes with it. So teaching and training. Look at verse 11. Command and teach these things. There's a strong statement really about authoritative teaching. But these things, what he's been saying. So under this teach faithful, let me just make this first point. Faithful teaching is teaching the things that have been passed down to us. In this context, Paul is basically saying, you tell them what I told you. You tell them the same things I said when I was there. Faithful teaching will not be novel teaching. One of the big pushes around us today is to try to be creative. Now, Creativity has a place. God made that. But everything needs to stay in its place. When Paul is talking about faithful teaching here, he doesn't talk about any grand oratory, being flashy, movie tie-ins for sermon series, or anything else to be all this kind of flash stuff. He just says, teach them the truth. Teach them the same things they've been hearing. One of the great professors at Princeton Seminary when it was the bastion of orthodoxy, unlike what it is now, said that one of his great pleasures of his time there, one of the things he was most proud of, is that never in his time did they teach a new thing. They taught the faith once for all delivered. We don't need new ideas. We need the same grand old truths. Freshly applied to our situation, of course, but those truths, this is what we need. This is what he is telling him to do. Proclaim these things. But a second aspect of faithful teaching, you can see in verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. We've been seeing that in this letter and in 2 Timothy when he talks about false teaching and he says, have nothing to do with it. Now, you may have to be aware of it. He says in other places to rebuke it. When he says, have nothing to do with it, he says, just don't give it any place. We don't need to focus on it. Now, some people are going to say, hey, I, I know this may, be not, may not be the truth, but this is really the going thing. Everybody's talking about this, so we need to get in on that a little bit in order to gain a hearing. And Paul's sentiment to that is, no. But that's what everybody wants to hear. Our goal isn't what everybody wants to hear. It's simply what everybody needs to hear. God has given us a word, and he has not asked us to be editors. He's only asked us to be auditors. That is to hear what he has to say. So we have no place for these irreverent, silly myths. The ministry of the word is not lashed to passing fads, but lashed to the eternal word. What we need to say as a congregation, what you have said in the past, what I trust you will continue to say, but I'm exhorting you today to continue to say to whoever stands before you to preach the word is simply this, give us the scriptures. Give us the word of God. And if you can illustrate that and help me see that, that's great, but just at least give me the scriptures. We must have the word of God. Other things can come and go, but if we do not have this, we're lost. So we don't waste time with these other things. A third thing here, notice in verse 13, 
is that he tells Timothy to devote himself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. There's several pieces here. So first just note, devote yourself. He doesn't simply say, make sure you're preaching, that's involved, but devote yourself. It's a strong language. Be intent on, give yourself fully to. And I think we're used to thinking about that in terms of preaching, so let me just stay there for a minute. The, the latter part, the exhortation and the teaching. You've been pretty clear, that's what you want in a pastor, and that's a good thing. The search committee has told us that we're getting close so, if we want a pastor amongst our other pastors, and the one who is going to be doing the bulk of the preaching and teaching, if we want him to devote himself to teaching, then we've got to make sure and give him the time to do so. There are a lot of things on the pastor's plate. We've talked about different ones of them. But if he's going to devote himself to the exhortation and the teaching, he's got to give himself to that, and we've got to say, Brother, take time in that. We've talked about this along the way, and I assume you know it. I'm going to say it again. You can't preach and teach the word faithfully if you just kind of look it up and walk up here and let it fly. Some people say that. I don't study. I just trust God. I ask them, do you do the same thing with your gas tank or with crossing the road? No, because that's not true. It takes work, which takes time. And we want somebody to devote themselves to that work and that time and to appreciate it when it's done then. So devote ourselves to this. But we normally think of teaching and preaching there, but notice he also mentions in verse 13, to the public reading of Scripture. Across churches, evangelical churches, I don't think we've noticed this as well. But that is the reason why here at First Baptist that we have several Scripture readings of some length. Because the Bible calls us to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture. This matters. In fact, we don't have time here, but I, I've done in other places a full presentation walking through documents we have from the history of the church from all the way back close to the first century where church leaders talked about what they did in their gathered worship, and it was largely filled with the reading of Scripture. Today, some people say, yeah, but, you know, I like preaching, maybe they say, but, you know, just the mere reading of the Scripture isn't nearly as helpful. Just think for a minute what you're saying if you say that. What you're saying is, I like to hear a mere man talk about it. Now, we're going to pray for him and hope that he's going to be following God's word, and that's valuable, and God calls us to preach. But when the Bible is read, we hear the very words of God. In many ways, this is one of the high points of our worship service, when the Scripture is read. And I'll just tell you, one of the things I love about our worship is our reading together. I was just thinking about it this morning as we read together and to hear the voices full and filling this room with the people of God together reading the Word of God, which is how we hear the voice of God. That's a beautiful thing. And this verse right here is one of the key reasons we do it. We need to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture and if you haven't paid as much attention to that, I have noticed over the years, I hear the Scripture differently when we read it together than when I read it privately. Now, I said differently. I'm not saying, well, hey, we read, the, we read the Bible together on Sunday. Don't worry about it the rest of the week. Not at all. I need that. I love that. But reading it together, I see some more things. Helps me think about us together. They're great compliments to one another. So where I started, if we're thinking about how do we grow as disciples, we need to receive faithful teaching. We need to be a part of the public reading of the scriptures. And we all are going to have different ways to participate in teaching ourselves. So as I said, it applies to pastors, but it applies to us. Parents, by definition, are teachers. 
uh, amongst our family, amongst our friends. When we see in the scripture, when it tells us to speak the word of God to one another, when Colossians tells us that in other places, well, we must know the scripture well enough to be able to speak it to one another. The ministry that goes on amongst us is led by pastors, but it cannot all be done by pastors. We need to be sharing the word with one another, and to do that, we need this kind of growth. Well, it was Chrysostom, one of the great early preachers in the church, who said, this is the cause of all evils, not knowing the scriptures. We need this to guide us. So teach faithfully. Second theme in here, be an example. This is alluded to in various places, but I'm really going to sit on verse 12 here. Where he says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. We'll read the rest of it in a minute. Now, this is sometimes the banner verse for youth ministry. Uh, it doesn't work real well since Timothy is probably in his 30s. Uh, but it also doesn't work real well when it's somewhat used in this way. For younger people to say, essentially, to pull up this verse and say, get off me. I'll just do whatever I want, and you can't despise me. This is not a verse that says people can't critique young people. This is a verse that says, don't let your youthfulness be a problem, but even if you're youthful, demonstrate maturity. This is not a blanket excuse to stay immature. This is a call to grow into maturity. This is a call he's saying, Timothy, you know you're in a challenging place. You're having to rebuke some false teaching. You know you're younger than a lot of these people. So the way this is going to have to work is you're going to have to show wisdom beyond your years. You're going to need to demonstrate maturity so that the people say, well, we kind of like what we're doing. We might could try not to listen to this guy, but the fact is that the maturity there compels us to take him seriously. So, teenagers, since I just took this verse away from you for the youth group banner, um, not that it was there already, but nonetheless, what this is saying to you is make the most of all the Bible teaching you get and grow into maturity. Again, not to say, look at me, I'm mature, anybody notice? But in order to be a blessing, in order not to be a drag, not a pull back on the church's witness, but part of what holds up the value and the beauty of the church's witness. I don't even have this in my notes, but it just came to my mind when I said that. The church I visited last week, I had not been there before, but I've known their pastor for a good while. And one of the things that jumped out to me was there was a wide range of different ages there who interacted well, a lot like what I see here, which is great. And the sparkle in the eye of the teenagers and the eagerness to hear the word of God. This is the kind of thing he's talking about. This is part of what commends the faith. But he's speaking not only to younger folks, he's speaking to all of us. And he says, be an example. Speak the truth and let the best illustration you have be your own life. Notice he says, to be an example in speech and in conduct. That's pretty much everything. In what you say and in what you do. In your words and in your behavior. What you do and how you talk about it. There's no place here for the, listen to what I say, not what I do. No, he's saying these things need to come together. And we know that. That's the definition of integrity. And we know we all struggle with that. But he's calling us forward. We need to be examples in these things. If we're not, folks are essentially going to say, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions are too loud. These have to come together. Word and deed. But then he also says, in love, in faith, in purity. Three standard virtues. Be an example in love. Now, back there in chapter 1, verse 5, when we were looking at it, Paul said the goal of proper biblical instruction is love. So this is the central Christian ethic. And so he's saying, 
we need to be an example in that with love shaping all that we do and say so that what we do and say is aimed for, calculated for the good of others. That's what loving deeds look like rather than merely for ourselves. In faith, that is, all of our words and deeds fit with the faith and are done in faith, trusting God. We live by faith. And we show people examples of that. I have benefited so much by watching other folks, particularly people further along in life than myself, when they face challenges and they don't disregard them, but they face them and when they know what God says obedience looks like, they just do it and say, we're going to have to trust God. That's what he's talking about. Then he says impurity. In a particularly impure environment, Examples of purity are priceless. Impurity is all around us in deeds and things. It's pushing in upon us in media of various sorts. And if we're not careful, because the world is so impure, we can think we're doing well because we're just a shade lighter. And we need to be completely different. And the way we do that is by helping one another with examples Examples of faithfulness when there's compromise all around. And so on that point, strong, pure models are one of the crying needs of our day. Looking at this text this week, it just hit me about how often in the various settings I am. And over this month, I'm traveling a lot, so I've been in a lot of different settings and in one way or another, what I hear at every place is, we need examples. Many people, in one way or another, are saying, I, I understand the basic point that Scripture says. I, I know the Bible's truth about it. But what does that look like? What, what does that look like when I go to elementary school tomorrow and I see this? What does this look like when I go to high school tomorrow? What does this look like? when I'm living and working in the medical field or in the education field or in plumbing or in whatever else, what does this look like as a parent? What does this look like as a grandparent? What does this look like as a single person? All of these areas. There aren't enough hours in the sermon, even if I took two hours, to go into all of those different places because that's not how it's to be done. How it's to be done is each of our lives being a testimony to that. And the fact is, somebody is watching you. And this has come up in a couple of other sermons before, but it's true. Some of you think you're too old for anybody to be noticing you. That's the way the world thinks. But I promise you, there are people looking to you as an example. Some of you think, I'm too young. But I promise you, there are people looking to you as an example. As we've parented along the way, we've talked about this, but then we've seen it with upper elementary and realizing there were younger children looking to those in upper elementary. In high school and recognizing there were younger children looking to the ones in high school. And then you can just work your way all the way up. So, kids, teens, somebody's looking to you. And somebody might say, I didn't know if this was okay to do, but this person did it. It must be fine. That's a scary thought. What we hope to be is for them to say, I wanted to know what it looked like to follow Jesus, and I'm listening and I'm learning, and then it is so helpful to be able to look to this young man, this young woman, and to say, that helps me understand a bit of what this looks like. And then it just goes up at each level. We're always looking for folks to help us. We know they're not perfect. And some of you say, well, I can't be an example to anybody. I'm not perfect. Uh, nobody's looking for perfect. Well, maybe somebody is. They're wrong. We're normally not looking for perfect. Most of us would say, hey, I get it. I know they're not perfect, but can you just show me a little bit of an example 
uh, when people have asked us something about parenting, we say, well, you know, this worked sometimes, this didn't, others, and folks are saying, well, just give me some ideas. Be an example. Again, if we're going to make progress individually and corporately, we must be receiving the word faithfully taught, and then we must be living that out to provide examples. And of course, one of the key ways we serve as an example is being quick to repent. That's one of the central aspects of discipleship because we know we haven't got it all figured out, but the way to make progress is to hear the word of God, seek to obey the word of God, repent when we fail, and keep moving forward. Whoever you are in here, if you have trusted Christ, we need your example. And we need your example at different times and different places. The faithfulness of the individual members is a powerful force to help us move forward in honoring God. But let me go to the third theme here. And I've called it train for godliness. So if we, we want to teach and receive faithful teaching, if we want to be an example, really all of that's got to come down to what I think this is the central piece of it, training for godliness. And he says this in several different ways. Look back to verse 6. When he's told him to put these things before uh, the brothers and be, he'll be a good servant, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Now, the training is going to be mentioned again when he says train yourself for godliness, but these are two different words. This one has the idea of being nourished. It's sometimes used of, of plants. If we think about that, making sure you have the right kind of nutrients in the soil and those kind of things so that a plant can draw the kind of nutrients that it needs and be nourished and therefore grow, that's the idea. He's talking about us being nourished, firmly planted in, the words of the faith, and the good doctrine. So this is not a picture of kind of skimming across the surface, which is too often what has been done in churches around our country. Where you, yeah, you kind of show up and you, you tip your hand to God and you touch base with the Bible a little bit and you just kind of skim along the surface and then say, I don't know why it doesn't work. You're not plugged in. We need to be nourished, shaped, trained, fed, developed, by the good words of the faith. So let's stay with our plant illustration. Let's say you had a plant of whatever sort. You can pick whichever kind you like, a flower or whatever else, and it's in some nice soil and the right people. Somebody like Dr. Brown has told you this has all the right nutrients in it. So it's in there. It's going kind of nicely, and you think, okay, great. Now I'm going to pull it out of the soil, and I'm going to take it with me some places, and I'm going to put it back in the soil for a couple hours every Sunday, but after that, I'm going to take it around and show it around. You know what you call that plant, right? Dead, exactly. And yet somehow, we think that's how our lives are going to work. Just run around with them rootless and then stick them in some soil for a little bit. We must be people who live in the Word of God. I don't mean you read the Bible all day and you don't go to work. I mean you read it daily, you ponder it, and you ask yourself, what does it look like to do your work in light of it? And you speak to one another about it so that we put our roots down deep. But he mentions it also in verse 7. I'm sorry, verse, yeah, the end of verse 7. Train yourself for godliness. Now this train, this is a word would have been mostly used in the first century in athletic kind of settings or whatever else. So physical training, that's where it would come from. And it even says, bodily training is of some value. If you wanted a text that told you you didn't need to exercise, this doesn't help you because it still says it's of some value. But it says, training our souls for godliness is of eternal value. And we know that. We know that we need to take care of our bodies. But with this text, we need to ask ourselves, do you reckon with the, the fact that it's the same thing about your soul? And train, this is the idea of physical training. And so you know, if you saw somebody who said, oh, let's make it me. If I said, you know what, I've decided I want to I run a marathon. Some of my colleagues run marathons and run 100 miles, so I'm going to do that. Now, you would laugh at me, and that would be appropriate. But if I said that, 
And then you saw me out somewhere casually walking. And you said, Ray, what are you doing? And I said, I'm training for a marathon. You would really wonder about me. If you never saw me sweat and exert myself, you would say, you are not training for this. It takes effort. Exactly. So he used that term to say, train yourself for godliness. If we're never panting or sweating, so to speak, about our spiritual growth, you're just playing games. Just like if I were just simply walking casually for a couple weeks and said, you know what, I'm not getting any closer to a marathon, you'd say, well, it's time to get serious. Same thing's true about our spiritual lives. If we're just floating along, we're not pushing ourselves in any way, we're not growing. And this becomes an important point because it cuts across one of the key lies in our culture. It comes from saying, just love yourself the way you are, and this is just how God made me. Like most of the bad lies, it has an element of truth. You don't need to try to be someone else. You don't need to look at, hey, I really wish I could be like that person and I want to do the things they do. No, that's not true. But you can't twist that to say, well, this is just who I am. If I was having heart trouble and I needed to exercise some more, it, nobody would be okay with me saying, I'm just, I just have heart trouble. It's just who I am. But you could exercise a little bit. No, no, no. I don't want to change who I am. Same thing in our character. There's no place for us to say, well, I'm just short-tempered. That's just me. Well, stop it. Train yourself for godliness. Insert whatever other temptation or sin that's there. The point of this text is, because of the fall, we are born sinful. And we cannot excuse any of that. We need to exercise ourselves to work on these things. And as we continue to struggle... Fine, we're struggling, but we're moving forward. We cannot excuse ourselves saying, that's just the way I am. We are supposed to be training. And when we're training then, we're working on our desires. We're working on our actions. We're working on our habits. We're not there earning salvation or earning God's favor, but we are now working out our salvation with fear and trembling because we love godliness, because we love God. And God gives us all the resources we need in that. But this verse is a call to action. We're putting our roots down deep in that previous verse, and now we are exercising ourselves. We are engaging in these things. Notice verse 10. For to this end, this is when he's talking about salvation, uh, godliness leads to eternal value. So to this end, we toil and strive. Those are some strong words for hard effort. That's what he's calling us to. We're going to come back to that verse here in just a minute because he talks about we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God. That is, it's worthwhile pouring ourselves into these things because our hope is set on the living God. God will not allow any of those labors to be in vain. It will seem like it's in vain sometimes. If you're serious about your spiritual growth and you pull yourself into it, you're going to hit some walls sometimes and feel like you're making no progress and you're going to hear the enemy whisper in your ear that it's useless anyway, but you're going to continue because you have set your hope on the living God who is the Savior of all people, particularly those who believe. I don't have time to chase it here. He is not setting up all people eventually get saved, and then there's some special realm of salvation for people who are believers. He is saying he is the one Savior available to all people, and particularly the ones who, who receive that are the ones who believe. Let me move us to one last verse here, verse 15 and 16. As he concludes it to Timothy, he says, Practice these things. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Again, practice, devote. He's calling us to action. There's no place for idleness. This is not merely theoretical. We do need to learn, and we talk a good bit about learning truths. If we skip the learning, we can't get there, but it can't stay with learning. 
We've got to learn, and then we've got to go do. We need, if you will, lecture, and then we need lab. If we just take in a lot of ideas, then we're going to be spiritually obese because you need to take in the nutrients, and then you need to act and use them. That's how we grow strong spiritually. Now, we could say more there, but as he says this, he says, do this so that, you, that all may see your progress. There's a note of encouragement there. His point isn't to draw the attention of other people, but his point is, if you practice and devote yourself to these things, you're going to make progress. It's going to be evident. It will be seen. A light set on a hill is seen by all. That's his point. Let people then see that progress as an encouragement to others. But then he says, particularly to Timothy and his role leading these people, keep a close watch on yourself, that's your behavior, your deeds, and on the teaching. Here he's summing up everything that's come to this point. So Timothy, guard closely. Keep a watch on what you do, how you live, and how you teach. Sums it all up. Persist in this. Don't give up. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now that verse is liable to shock us a little bit. Because Paul just said, Timothy, do these things and you will save yourself. Do these things and you will save your hearers. You will save the congregation. And we're probably thinking, wait a minute, Jesus is the only one who can save. Okay, but this is God's word. What's he say? In the New Testament, save is used of that initial conversion. Yes, that's what we normally think about. It's also used in terms of persevering in the faith. And we haven't thought enough about that, generally speaking. This is what he's talking about here. We've touched on through this couple of series how the Scripture is very clear that there will be people who profess faith and then walk away, showing that they never truly were converted. Paul is saying here, Timothy, persist in these things faithfully, and this is how you will help yourself to persevere in the faith and make it safely home to heaven, and this is how you will help the congregation persevere in the faith and make it safely home to heaven. So let me pause there just to mention, you notice how important the role of pastors is there? So again, we're praying for a search committee. We may be close. And this text says to those who stand before the people of God, persist in these things, persist in the pursuit of knowing God and knowing his word and exercising and training for godliness and keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine, because in so doing, you will save those who hear you. Now, in this setting, those who hear you, that's you and me. That makes calling a pastor a pretty big deal. It also reminds us that, generally speaking, the Scripture doesn't expect us to faithfully persevere in the faith without faithful shepherding. We need that. It highlights the importance of that. So we should pray and encourage those who are involved in that. Then step back another step. The last verse of the first paragraph, the last verse of the second paragraph, come back to the hope of salvation. Because the point in all of it is we toil and strive because we set our hope in the living God. We persist in these things because there's the hope of salvation. It is the truth of the resurrection which can empower us when we're weary, when we are struggling and uncertain, we don't rest our hope on our efforts. We strive and toil, but we do so because we rest our hope on the living God, that he is the Savior. And in light of that, we are empowered to go forward. But you may be listening, and if you've not rested your hope in that living God, if you've not repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, you don't have the power to do these things. And all the good things you can try to do won't add up. The wrath of God hangs over your head currently. But this God 
has promised that if you will repent of your sins and trust in him, even today he will save you and strengthen you to walk in this kind of way where true life is found. And I would plead with you then trust him. And believers, I would plead with us, trust him. And so give ourselves to this kind of pursuit and give up on the just passing by, floating along. But let's be wholehearted, serious believers, pressing on to the fullness of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, we will be prepared to be the lighthouse to the world he intends us to be. Let me ask you to bow your heads to consider God's word this morning. We're going to sing in a moment as we regularly do. There'll be a chance to respond. You may need to just sing. And that be your way of responding to the Lord. The song we're going to sing is giving us language of giving ourselves over fully to God. You may need to come and talk with someone. We'll be down here at the front. You may need to call out to the Lord for salvation. You may need to move your membership. Whatever it is, you will have this opportunity. Father, we thank you again for your word. Thank you that you give us meaningful things to engage in. Forgive us, Lord, for taking your salvation too lightly, too often. Help us to be people who earnestly pursue godliness so that your truth can be seen and you will be honored and souls will be saved in your kingdom advance. Do your work in our midst, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.